Hey everybody, I'm Michigan Jay, and today on Alternative Placement Art History, we are going to talk about race. <laughs> you mean that social construct that only exists because we keep talking about it? You know, if we'd stop talking about race, racism wouldn't be a problem. Just like if we'd stop talking about diseases, people wouldn't get sick anymore. Okay, so having heard that out loud for the first time, I realize now how incredibly stupid that is. I withdraw my comment. Cool. So race may be a social construct, but as Shaniqua Walker Barnes argues in her book, I Bring the Voices of My People, that doesn't mean it's not real, or that it and the racism that came with it haven't been impacting the lives of billions of people for centuries. How was it constructed, though? To be sure, it was done over a long period of time by a variety of European nations. But today we're going to specifically look at how race was constructed during the colonial period in the Americas by the Spanish Empire. The Spanish became the first Europeans to colonize the Americas when Columbus established settlements in Hispaniola and San Salvador on his famous first expedition in 1492. His perceived success opened the door for future expeditions and an expanding appetite for territory in the New World, both for Spain and other European nations. After Hernán Cortés came to the New World to gently persuade the indigenous populations in Cuba and Mexico to submit to Spanish rule and convert to Christianity, one of the tricky tasks for the new regime was maintaining control in this new world. Okay, hold on. What exactly was new about this world? Nothing. Had it just sprung into existence? Nope. Hadn't the people who lived there established a myriad of civilizations and cultures for thousands and thousands of years already? Absolutely. So this is more like new to you? Yeah, if by new to you you mean it used to be yours and now it's mine. Gotcha. After the initial slaughter and destruction of cities, Cortes and subsequent Spanish rulers actually needed the indigenous population to provide the labor necessary for mining and agriculture in order to make New Spain profitable. Wait, they invaded another civilization? Yep. Killed thousands and thousands of people? Mm-hmm. Burned cities to the ground? Totally. And then said, you actually need to work for us because this whole thing will be pointless if we can't make any money? Exactly. Gotcha. Unfortunately, Columbus, Cortes, and the rest of the Spanish didn't just bring over guns and a rapacious appetite for gold and silver. They and other European imperialists also brought over European diseases, which the indigenous population had no immunity to, and killed an enormous amount of the population. With their labor force decimated, the Spanish eventually decided that the only way to make any money would be to copy the English and the French and start using African slaves in addition to the dwindling indigenous population. Okay, so explain Columbus Day to me again. The series of events created a very diverse racial and ethnic population in New Spain, which was far more nuanced than the stark black-white dichotomy in the British colonies in the United States. One potential reason for this is the fact that most British settlers were coming over as family units, which made mixing with the indigenous populations less likely. The Spanish, however, were sending over thousands and thousands of male soldiers to South and Central America, with very few women, which practically guaranteed that they would have sex with and sometimes even marry the indigenous women, even if it was technically prevented by Spanish law. In order to ensure a monopoly on power on this racially mixed continent, the Spanish created a distinct racial hierarchy with, spoiler alert, them on top. Oh, um, yeah. <sighs> Shocking. Our works of art for today are called Casa Paintings, it's an 18th century genre of painting that visualized this hierarchy in a textbook-like fashion and clearly explained not only what happens when different races mix, but what to call the offspring. Babies? They typically consist of a set of 16 scenes that reveal this hierarchy to be a sliding scale of whiteness, with the lightest skinned people on the top and the darkest on the bottom. Invariably, the first scene is called a Spaniard and an Indian produce a mestizo, which shows the product of a white Spanish man and a high-level indigenous woman, and is actually really helpful for those awkward moments when your kid asks you, where do mestizos come from? Well, kiddo, you see, when an 18th century racist colonialist Spaniard and a wealthy indigenous Nahua woman fall into a socially coercive and financially exploitative relationship, he inserts his erect penis into her vagina and ejaculates semen containing sperm cells, 
one of which will join with the woman's egg cell and grow from a mestizo blastocyst, or a blastocizo, to a mestizo embryo, or an embryostizo, to a mestizo fetus, or a fetistizo, and finally to a human being with light brown skin. The oldest known Costa painting is from 1711. This example was painted by Juan Rodriguez Juarez in 1715, which makes it one of the oldest known. And it also reveals the fact that depicting this racial hierarchy didn't start until about 200 years into Spain's rule. So the obvious question is, why does that demented egg in a wig look like it's about to eat that baby? What prompted artists to start painting these things so long after the Spanish conquest? I like my question better. First, as is true of almost all works of art prior to the 19th century, artists didn't choose to paint them. They were commissioned by wealthy and powerful people. So again, why does that guy look like an 18th century Voldemort picking out his next Horcrux victim? Were Costa paintings, or a strung out Mozart reaching out for his next hit of laudanum, suddenly in demand from the ruling class in New Spain? Or the ghost of Isaac Newton discovering a fourth law of motion? Okay, I'm done. The Enlightenment was becoming more and more prominent in the worldview of the European elite, and the methods of classifying plants and animals into ordered systems was eventually applied to human beings as well. The ruling elite in Spain and the rest of Europe used this emerging scientific worldview to legitimize their dominance of other people all around the world by creating this pseudo-scientific taxonomy that enshrined whiteness as the pinnacle of everything good, powerful, intelligent, and beautiful. There's a slow shift away from purely religious explanations of why certain people are in charge, i.e. the divine right of kings, to these allegedly scientific ones, though these two have worked in tandem for a long time through arguments like it's just the way God created things. Costa paintings visualize this created order. Juarez's painting is typical of the genre in that it's modeled after a holy family painting, which consists of a Virgin Mary, baby Jesus, and Joseph, and sometimes a baby John the Baptist or an angel. And it also subtly underscores that divine created order argument. We know the Spaniard is from the upper class because of his fancy clothes, outrageous powdered wig, and practically translucent white skin, a sign that his status allows him to spend most of his time indoors. Seriously, has he ever seen the sun before? He looks like an unmasked Darth Vader picking out a ripe cantaloupe. Okay, seriously, I'm done now. His wife also comes from the upper class, and it's her clothing that lets us know this as well. She's wearing a beautiful, colorful repeal, a type of dress worn by indigenous women in Central America with a lacy white headdress and expensive jewelry. Their son rides on the back of a darker-skinned servant who looks up at the Spaniard with a look that either says, I wish you were my dad, or please don't eat me. After a Spaniard and Indian produce a mestizo, some of the other categories found in Costa paintings include a castizo, which is a mestizo father and a Spanish mother, a Spanish father and a black mother produce a mulatto, a mulatto father and a Spanish mother produce a morisco. A no te entiendo father and an Indian mother produce a torne atras, which means return backwards. And a campo mulatto father and a cambuja mother produce a tente en el aire, which means hold oneself suspended in midair. The thing I like about racism is how much sense it makes. In many Costa paintings, the change in skin color is also accompanied by a change in surroundings. The darker the skin, the greater the poverty. And in some series, there's also a corresponding change in the family harmony. White settings are images of domestic bliss, like the Holy Family. But as the skin gets darker, the strife and discord increase. The message is clear. The darker the skin, the less civilized the person. Because we enjoy relatively easy access to works of fine art today, whether it's on the internet or museums or private collections, I think there's a temptation to assume that Costa paintings and other works of fine art were actually seen by the general public when they were made, and therefore must have been directed towards them, or at least held some meaning for them. But like most works of art from before the 19th century, Costa paintings weren't ever displayed publicly. They hung on palace walls or in the homes of the extremely wealthy. So they weren't some sort of billboard to remind the masses of where they stood. People knew where they stood socially. They lived that reality every day and had lived it for the past 200 years. These were paintings for the white ruling class, to look at and be reminded of why they deserved to rule, something to stroke the fragile ego of people who are so desperate to be in charge of a rational, orderly, enlightened society. It's a detached, pseudo-academic view of humanity from the vantage point of white supremacy. Costa paintings are a lie, not about the prevalence of interracial marriage or the racial hierarchy, but about how neat and tidy everyone's little box was. The social reality of the Spanish Empire 
in the 18th century is far more complex than 16 neat little boxes. Plus, there is a certain amount of fluidity to these racial distinctions. There are several examples of individuals either asking for or being granted whiteness as a reward. Jose Diabara, Miguel Cabrera, Juan Patricio Morete Ruiz, all highly prominent, celebrated Mexican artists who, according to the hierarchy, were either mulatos or mestizos, were granted the title of Spaniard in the 1753 census as a reward for their cultural contributions to New Spain. One Spaniard actually lobbied to have his wife's name switched from the Book of Mixed Blood, or literally the Book of Broken Color, <laughs> Mudbloods, to the Spanish book. Yes, there are actually two different books that one's name could be written in after your baptism. One for people who could prove Spanish descent from both sides of their family, and the other one for everybody else. Just like the Muggleborn Registration Commission in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. J.K. Rowling writing an allegory of 18th century Spanish colonialism? I've got to go read those books at... for the first time ever. Costa paintings are not a documentary of life in New Spain. They are white supremacy masquerading as objective social science. But if these paintings didn't mean anything to the general public back then, what good are they for us now? Memes? One thing that we can learn from these paintings is just how enduring these ideas actually are. <laughs> well, please like any political or social ideology from the 18th century could have any practical impact on us today. Again, I withdraw my comment. Many of the classifications used in these paintings are still used today in Mexico and other Central American countries. And beyond the use of these categories, we can see the origins of whiteness itself as a tool used in the Americas for domination. The truth that Costa paintings reveal is that race as we experience it in the Americas was a construction of white Europeans that enabled them to control, dominate, and profit from the labor of other human beings. It justified colonialism and slavery, and it was maintained afterwards for centuries, both formally and informally, as a way of retaining power. Just one look at the current socioeconomic status of whites versus that of people of color, both in the United States and throughout the Americas, reveals just how permanent and pernicious the system of white supremacy continues to be. So yes, race is a social construct, but understanding who constructed it and why will help us hopefully not to dismiss it as some irrelevant or imaginary abstraction, but as a concrete reality that we all inhabit, for better or worse. Huh. It's almost like the difference between admitting that there's a novel, highly infectious, potentially deadly disease and doing the hard work of addressing it head on, and pretending that it doesn't exist and it's not infectious or deadly and seeing hundreds of thousands of people die. That would be ridiculous. Indeed. That's all for today. Remember, be sure to lord your newly acquired art history knowledge over someone you know, and we'll see you next time on Alternative Placement Art History. 